shitty marketing pisses me off. Gets me physically and visibly angry, and it happens a lot. I mean, granted, it's my fault because I click on everything I see, every link in an email, every paid ad I see, banners, social, because I want to get a sense of how marketing is, how it's being done, see if I can spot trends, see if I can find a way to help make people make it better. But whenever I travel to speak to a new city, I reset all the anger and hate, and I go into tourist mode and I'll search for something that a tourist might search for in that city. So, came to Boston, not Boston, sorry, Sydney on Wednesday, and uh, I searched for the best Sydney walking tours. Now, I'm gonna walk you through the different ads that were presented to me on the way to the one I actually clicked on. So first of all, I got this. Now, I wanna go for a walk, but that's a little further than I was intending, so I'm gonna skip that ad. Next one, okay, hiking tours in New South Wales. We're getting closer, but I wanna go for a walk, not a hike. I'm gonna skip that too. MS Sydney Gong Ride, uh, is it a new Microsoft product? Maybe it's multiple sclerosis, I don't know. But at least it's Sydney, we're getting closer and closer. So the next one, finally, Sydney Walking Tours. This is what I asked for, it's the only ad that promised this thing. The description looks kind of lame, but I'm going to click on it anyway. <laughs> Come on! <laughs> now I'm angry again. This is a cycling tour in what looks like Cambodia. This is not what the ad promised me. Bullshit. It's just not good. The sad truth is, I mean, I've looked at over 50,000 landing pages, and the sad truth is that some are amazing, a lot are really bad, but for the most part, they're just completely mediocre. They're average. They're like a flat line of suck, and it's not good enough. Delight should be the default, not the exception. We shouldn't be making our customers, our potential customers, feel confused, angry, or lost. We want to make them feel a bit more like this. Now, I'm not suggesting you feed LSD to your children. That would be a little unfair. But that's the kind of reaction we should be trying to get so people actually enjoy being part of our marketing experiences. Now, this is my favorite ad of all time. They took shreddies, rotated them by 45 degrees, making a new product that actually sold more. That's delightful, that's really cool. I will never forget that. And coincidentally, shreddies have four corners, which leads me to why I'm here. Now, the Four Corners framework is massive. This looks like the London Underground map. Um, what it is, when you can understand where, how copy design, interaction, and psychology play together, you can start designing, creating delightful and high converting marketing experiences. Now, I'm going to talk about campaigns. You can apply most of what I'm going to tell you to anywhere on your website, but your website is for organic traffic. Landing pages are for marketing campaigns, which is what I'm going to focus on. Now, I'm going to go through each of the corners, explaining some of how it works, and then at the end, I will take two really important parts of your page, video and forms, and apply all four to that, so you can see how you can actually apply it. Uh, I'll start with copy. There's a lot on your page that has copy. Um, this, every, most elements on your page have some kind of form of copy, but there's also higher level things like clarity, context, congruence. Then there's voice of you. So this is your brand tone and voice. Then there's voice of customer. That's your brand. What do they think about you? How do they speak about you? You have to merge those things together. There's probably a lot of startups here, and the value proposition of your business is the most important thing to get people to understand quickly. And one of the secrets to clarity, and clarity is everything in conversion, is it lies in the information hierarchy, which is the order in which you tell your story. Now, with all the pages I see, I spot some trends. One of them is evident in this <laughs> HubSpot landing page. <laughs> That's convenient <laughs> in the order. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in on the headline, the subhead. Now, the headline, definitely not your everyday product demo. That's kind of meaningless. It doesn't tell me anything about what HubSpot does. But if you look 
at the subhead, see how HubSpot can help you grow traffic, leads, and sales. That's exactly what they do. Now, your subhead is supposed to add clarity. It shouldn't be the only thing that has clarity. So I wanted to run an experiment to see if people could understand what HubSpot does. So I went to Usability Hub and ran a five second test. Now, if you're not familiar, basically you upload a screenshot of your page, it stays up for five seconds, comes down, and then you ask a question. So I took this page, I removed the logo and the mention of HubSpot in the subhead, so there's no immediate brand recognition. And I just simply asked the question, what does this product do? And these are the responses I got. Now, if this is your business, that's not what you want to see. Right? Someone arriving on your page and going, Ugh. so may maybe they're searching for something. They click on an ad, it's your competitor, and they go, that's pretty cool. I'm going to see who else does that. They go back, click on another ad, and they go, bah, 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 bah. no idea. And they leave. You just lost them. So it's really important. So what I did, like nobody got it right, not a single person. So I took that and I flipped it. I put the subhead first. And then I ran the experiment again. HubSpot <laughs> lets you grow traffic, leads, and sales. This is exactly what the product's about, just by putting that clarity first. Now, 60% of people got it right. And if you're as good at math as I am, you'll know that if you go from zero to 60, that's a conversion lift of infinity, which is really quite good. If you tell your boss or client, I lifted conversions by infinity, you're going to look pretty special. So <laughs> flip your headlines. I don't mean just flip it and leave it, but do that and take a look at what the subhead says if you have one, um, and then bring some of that clarity back into your headline. It will really work well for you. Here's a conversation on a phone I want to read out with you. So how was the date last night? First date, went to dinner, then I walked her home, then I killed her in the woods outside her house and left. <laughs> Killing her seems a bit harsh. Did she order the lobster at dinner? <laughs> trying to say kiss. We've all had these moments, these autocorrect problems. My point is that what we say and what other people hear are often two entirely different things. Here are a few examples. Okay. <laughs> or <laughs> maybe a bit more appropriate for Elton. <laughs> that actually would be ironic, unlike every other line in that song. <laughs> it's like rain, 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 rain. Good luck getting that out of your head. I think we've replaced the Celine Dion from, from Race Talk. Uh, <laughs> clarity problems. Clarity kills conversion all the time. You can always rely on that guy for something special. If you have a clarity problem, you run an experiment like that, and you see there's something going wrong, people aren't understanding you, this is a really good tip. Ask your customers to write your headline for you, because they know you're often too close. We're often too close to our own business. They'll understand the words, the phrases, the terminology that explains why they became a customer, why they love your product or what you do. It's a nice way of, you'll, you'll get surprised, like, oh, never thought about it that way. Okay, so design, there are a lot of visual elements on your page, uh, but I want to talk about 23 principles of attention-driven design. These are design principles you can use to focus people's attention on what you want them to do. I, w I can't do all 23, I'm just going to run through a couple. The good thing about principles like this, because nobody's been taught how to design for conversion, nobody, it's never happened. It's not part of any curriculum, it's just design's always been about making something look great without really consideration for why you're making design decisions. And these principles, when you understand them, it opens up a different vocabulary so you can talk with your designers, talk with other marketers, and you can say, I'm not sure about what you're doing here. I think if we apply this principle, we can enhance how we get people to pay attention.
Distraction is kind of the simplest of them all. Um, I was in Edinburgh recently, and my sister lives there, and she was having problems with the pipes in her kitchen. So being a good brother, I searched for the best 24-hour plumber in Edinburgh. Good ad. Okay, so I'm going to click on this. I want to find a plumber. Um, <laughs> wrong one. And this is what I get. Classic home page experience. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get angry. And, but as a marketer, you have three options when you run a campaign. You can send your traffic to a home page like that. You can go to an internal page, or you can go to a dedicated landing page. Okay, so I'm going to walk through this and show you how to change this to those three things and see how it impacts what's going on. So again, I asked, I did a five second test and I asked, what service does this company offer? Okay, 30% of people got plumbing. And that's because they have multiple products. Lots of people do, they have multiple services. So, you know, they're seeing building, they're seeing construction. Only a few recognize that they had plumbing. So now we're gonna go internal page. Now there's a little bit of a signal, the nav is highlighted, and there's a bit of a content change, but not really. 40% of people got it right this time. So now I'm going to fix it and make it more of a dedicated experience. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take out the social share buttons because nobody is going on Twitter saying this plumber was so good. His, like, this thing he had is just, yeah. And they're not going on Google Plus going, he came at 2 a.m. and cleaned my pipes. It was a wonderful experience. This is not going to happen. So we're taking those out. I'm going to remove the nav, take away the building because that's not relevant, and change a few bits of the copy to say plumbing. It still looks like crap, but it's a bit more targeted. 80% got it right. It's very simple. Take away. If you're running any kind of advertising, you have to make it really, really well matched to what the ad is. But why did it perform better? That's an angry Vikings way of saying, never start a marketing campaign without a dedicated landing page. Just remember that acronym. It's very simple. It's kind of the foundation of successful campaigns. I'll be testing you at the party later after a few pints. <laughs> big data, everyone talks about big data. I don't even know what big data is, so today I'm gonna talk about decently sized data instead. <laughs> we did some data mining into the unbounced back end. We've had over you know, a million and a half pages have been published through the system, but we just looked at 50,000 for, for this instance, and I wanna share some of these. They're like aggregate average conversion stats, and they're pretty interesting. So with the whole distraction thing, let's look at the conversion rate according to how many links there are on the page. Now this is for lead gen. There's a form on the page, and I'm not including links that say privacy policy or terms and conditions, because I don't consider them distractions. Nobody clicks on them, and they're often, if you're doing PPC, they're a nice signal to Google that you have a full website somewhere, so that can actually be benef beneficial. As you add more links to the page, it's fairly predictable, it keeps going down and down and down, right? So obviously, one is good. Interestingly though, the average is 4.39. What this means, out of this sample size, just looking like everyone can improve, but just looking at these, these, these people on the average, like so most people in the room, let's say, there, there are 8,000 companies who could increase their conversion rates by around 50% by removing three links. Won't work for everybody because it's an average, but try it. You know, take remove some ego from your pages. You don't need your CEO's Twitter handle. You don't need. Don't put things like. Don't follow if you're doing content marketing or something. Don't follow the Amazon model. Like if you like this, you might like this. No, that's helpful, but it's not good for conversion. If it's an ebook or a webinar, here's some other resources. Take them out. It's not going to help conversions. What you're trying to do is get your attention ratio to one to one. And attention ratio is a ratio of number of things you can do on a page to the number of things you should be doing. And remember, a marketing campaign only has one goal, so you should only be doing one thing. Try and get to one to one. And normally, who do you look at in this photo, assuming you don't know, you haven't seen me before? You don't look at anyone, right? You look at the group. How about now? Now you're looking at me because I'm anomalous. I'm the only one that's doing something different. <laughs> yeah, I look like an asshole because I'm wearing sunglasses at night in a bar. But you get my point. If you look at it graphically, which square do you look at? None of them. But if I do this, immediately your attention is drawn into there. Think of uh, an event like this. You have speakers. All of their mugshots are there. Every day you do a social campaign with a Twitter card with their face and a quote, come and see this person speak. You click and you get to there, you're like, uh, where is this person? Where is she? I want to see her. I can't, I can't find her. 
if it was rotated like this, immediate recognition, ah, cool, she's there, I'm gonna see who else is there, awesome, I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna buy a ticket. It's a much better way of delivering on the promise of the ad, unlike that stuff we saw before. And it's also the perfect place to put a diamond shreddy. <laughs> uh, I was on a podcast recently, and someone on our team sent me this screenshot from iTunes. And so which of these episodes stands out? All right, it's mine, because... <laughs> and now for the next couple of months, because iTunes forces you to do that, next couple of months, mine is going to be the most important as it goes down, because it's anomalous. Affordance. This is how well does the visual... Uh, how something looks infer how you can use it. So a round door handle, you can turn it. A flat one, you can push it down. I was in Philadelphia last week and recorded this video. Have a, have a watch. This is a Fordance, people. This says pull. This also says pull. <laughs> I'm pretty strong, but I'm not going to get it out. This is a pull mechanism. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> There's things you can do wrong with affordance. Let's look at an element on a page. Let's look at a button. Okay, this looks like a button. It's got rounded corners and it has depth. You feel like you can push it down. Buttony, there's no depth, but it has rounded corners. That's just a rectangle with a word in it. Nothing more, nothing less. Flat design, whatever. <laughs> Every year there are new design trends that come in, they're not validated, they're not tested, they're not proven, it's just on a whim that we're going to do this now, and it can impact conversions, and then that might be clickable, but it's just a word. So I wanted to do an experiment. Again, this is our homepage, and you can see the main call to action, two design principles. Uh, contrast, it stands out, and affordance, it looks clickable, it's curved corners, rounded corners. It's hard to see it there, but it does have some depth to it. And I turned it into ghost buttons. All right, so now I want to run a, a click test. I went back to Usability Hub. It's a great way of doing some qualitative research to it as like an input. Like you don't just do that and then trust that you use it as an input with all the other research you do to inform when you do a scientific A-B test. So I did a click test. I said, where would you click to make another page. Now, notice the language. I didn't say build a page because build is written on there. You don't want to lead people, so I just said something generic. And the first one, predictably, most people are going into the call to action. That's what we want. And the second one, look at them all moving down. 600% increase in people clicking things that aren't clickable because they have the same level of affordance as the button. Like, oh, I think that's a button, so this is the same because it's just something with a, with a white stroke around it. But it's not, so be careful of things like that. Proximity is probably the most dangerous of the principles. Um, elements in close proximity to one another are perceived to have a relationship. So think about the Jackson 5. So Jackson 5 are over here, loaded with talent. These guys are awesome, blah, blah, blah. You move Michael over here, <laughs> they suck now <laughs> because he's not in proximity anymore. Put them back together and it works. So here's a f just a few quick actual A-B tests, scientific. Uh, this is a free course. Just click through. All you need to do is click the button, start the course. I read a case study about a psychological principle known as the Hobson's plus one choice effect, which is where people like to make a good choice. They feel good about themselves when they make a choice. So the idea is you put something in close proximity to your call to action, something that people don't really want to do, so they'll do the thing you do want them to do. In this case, start a free trial of Unbounds. That's quite aggressive. This is just content. Why would you want to sign up for some, so some software? I ran this test. 14% less people click the button. Now I'm thinking, yeah, they're all clicking the link. They're all becoming customers. This is great. 2,000 people went through this test. One person clicked the link and signed up. So just by having, and it doubled the attention ratio, right? There's this other link there. The reason is when you're about to click on something and there's something else there, you're like, ooh, why is that there? And it, it makes you think. And then you go like, hey, you know, I've changed my mind. It's just a bad thing to do. I ran another test. I was using... Sean's company, Qualaroo, to do some research. Why aren't you taking 
starting the course. And people said, I don't know how much it costs. It says free on the button. <laughs> I'm just going to emphasize that. So I put my mug there. I hope you enjoy this free course. Just to try and emphasize the free thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's an actual vanity metric. <laughs> it's just close proximity. It's Every test I do, I used to think that you can put things close to your call to action to inspire people to click. You can, but it's difficult. Every single test I run where I put something there fails. So if you're going to do it, trust seals, whatever it is, you have to test it because there's a really good chance it will have a negative impact. So I have all of those in this ebook, all 23, lots of great case studies and examples of how you can use them. And I'd encourage you to get this just because we can start building that new vocabulary, shared vocabulary, so we can all talk about why we're designing the way we're designing. Okay, interaction. Like I said, there are new trends every year. And one of the problems is themes. Now, they can be great if you can't design or code. You can buy a theme for 50 bucks and you have a website. It's very quick, which is good for startups. But the problem is theme designers are the worst for just putting everything in there. And every interactive element on your page can actually be quite complex. If it's really well done, great interaction design, you don't feel it. You don't know it's happening. But if you do it wrong, it's bad. And everything has an interaction model. So. Carousels have been shown time and time again to kill conversions, yet people still do them because it's shiny and it moves and everything. So you show up and like, oh, this is interesting, and it's gone. You're like, oh, I don't know how to get it back. And it's not a good thing. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. Autoplay, play, pause, rollover, pause, previous and next nav. Those are really little annoying little white dots at the bottom that you can't find. And then there's a light colored slide and it disappears. And you're like, fuck, what is going on here? One of them says where you are, and the call to action on each slide, mobile swiping maybe. If you're going to use a carousel, if your boss wants one in there, or if you want to put one in there, here's how you should do it. Make it user driven, no autoplay ever, and put tabs on it and say what you'll get when you go to that slide. So this, this, or this. Now it's user controlled, and then what you wanna do is put a heat map on there and see which ones people are interested in. Because then you go, oh, everybody clicks on slide two, none of these. And you can delete them and just have what people are actually asking for. It's a really good way of turn, taking something bad and making it good. <laughs> There's this thing called scroll jacking, which is prevalent in themes. And whenever I see a page that has this, I uh, immediately leave. I want to show you a video of me trying to interact with this page. I'm trying to get to the middle of the page. I'm going to try and scroll down the page. When I do, it accelerates for me, which means it, it, it doesn't stop when I stop. It just keep, keeps going. So this part is in the middle. Of it. I'm going to try and get to the middle of the page. No. No. <laughs> I have to scroll. I have to nudge it and wait to see if it see if it'll stop in the middle. <laughs> see how hard that was? You can scroll a little bit. You take your finger off, and it keeps going. Breaking 20 years of interaction design rules. If you're going to buy a theme, sometimes if you go into the settings, you can turn some of these things off. Parallax can look beautiful if it's done right. It's usually done wrong. You can turn off a lot of these things and make it load faster. It's cleaner, simpler, not so much stuff going on. So if you, if you need to do a theme, try and turn off those things. Because none of this stuff's verified. You just throw it all in. Uh, psychology. Does anyone know the most persuasive word in the English language? Free. Free. Free, you, yes. OK. It's actually this. Because, 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 because. Because. <laughs> We're primed as children to believe what comes after the word because. You know, we you ask your parents a question, they say because, blah, blah, blah. Like, Daddy, why is the sky blue? Or, Mommy, why is Daddy always hanging out with the babysitter? <laughs> because, <laughs> so we trust that stuff. So I looked at the data again. How many, what is the impact of having the word because on your landing page? So <laughs> this is the conversion rate, saying because more often, ooh, it's going down, it's going down. 
and it suddenly jumps up and jumps up even more. So apparently if you say it 19 times, this is probably a long form sales letter with lots of persuasive copy. This is a low sample size, so don't take it very seriously. Uh, there are three levels of psychology at play. Um, it's kind of like white, gray, and black hat in SEO. White hat, this is influence. These are the things you possess, traits that can influence people. Or scarcity, there's not much of this. Okay, I'm interested. Then there's persuasion. These are tactics you can use to influence someone to do something. That's okay also. But then there's manipulation. This is the bad side of marketing. And some of the tactics here, they work, but they're not nice. They're not what people should be doing. We've all seen this, right? You're trying to leave, and this comes up, and this is good cop, bad cop. And that's not just from movies, it's an actual psychological principle. And you have to get out of it, you have to click on something you don't agree with. And it's not good. So I was on my phone playing a game, a kid's game, whatever, and uh, I ran out of moves. I couldn't complete the level. So now this pop-up comes up, and I have a choice. I can spend some money to get a few extra moves, or I can try again. Again, as children, we're primed that trying again, we're taught it's a good thing. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. That's good. A week later, I came back. <laughs> I see what you're doing here. <laughs> again, we're taught giving up is a bad thing. It's negative. This is negativity bias. Things that are negative have more power than things that are positive. Uh, so I wanted to do a click test to see what was going on here. I simply asked, where would you click for another game? And predictably, you should try again, right? That's what you want to do. With this version, though, everybody's moving over to the payment side because they don't want to give up. Do you really want your kid to be clicking give up 50 times a day, <laughs> affecting their self-esteem? Maybe in a micro way, a little melodramatic, but I am. 263% increase in people going for the payment option. So they're probably making a shit ton of money, but that's manipulation. It's manipulating children. It's not a good, it's not a nice way to do it. There are nice ways, and this is Joanna Weeb's version of Good Cop, Bad Cop. Instead of, if you don't want this guide, you just say, I reject the guide. That's fine. I'm saying the guide sucks, not me or anything like that. So you can do these things well. And this converts really well also. So there's always a nice way of doing these things. OK, so that's the four corners. And now I'm going to apply them to video and then forms. Now, uh, my friends at Wistia gave me access to some of their data from 80,000 landing pages, pages uh, that have video on them to see what you can do to increase play rates and um, engagement. Would you watch this video? Perhaps. It's not very compelling. How about now? Now there's an interesting caption. Probably true. And there's a bit of psychology. It's only eight seconds. Oh, that's, that's OK. And there's a big shiny button that actually says it's a video. Before that, it wasn't so much of a video. So there's some design going on there as well. Captions are incredibly important. When someone comes to your page and there's a big shiny object, like a video or something, maybe I don't have my headphones in or I'm in a quiet place and I can't watch the video. But if it's a compelling caption, then I'm going to go, huh, that's interesting. I will find my headphones or I'll make time to watch the video. It's really important. OK, where should you put the video on the page? People talk about the fold. Everyone's scared of the fold. These are 250 pixel zones. And you can see from here, the play rate, as soon as you hit the average kind of fold level, about 700, 750 pixels, it cuts in half. So when it comes to video, the fold does matter. Put it above the fold. How big should it be? Well, 540 by 400 seems to be the ideal, maybe because it's not overwhelming. And if it was small, you're like, I don't want to watch that. I can't see it. So that's a good size to have it. And now look at the interaction model of the video. Again, there's a lot of stuff. You can play, pause, stop, time step, jump, autoplay, have a CTA to go somewhere else, annotations throughout. You can scrub through it, full screen share, embed, and turn style. Turn style is that little email box that pops up at a certain point and says, if you want to continue, you have to put your email address in. The ideal place to put, don't put it at the start, because someone's like, ah, that's nasty. Don't like that. Put it at the end, nobody cares, because they've already watched it. 14% of the way through is the ideal place to do that, because you've told a little bit of your story before you're asking for something.
Who should you put in your video? If it's live action, you have a person, don't put the government in it, nobody trusts the government. Don't put your CEO in it either, because that doesn't work. Uh, tribes, people we can relate to are good, and then experts are best. Uh, this is my company, Unbounce, and they're an amazing group of people, and one of the main reasons for that I believe is our unique hiring process. If you send us your CV, your resume, we will just turn it in half or delete it. We won't look at it at, at all. What we want you to do instead is go into the app, open a free account, build a landing page, and tell us why we should hire you and why you want to work for us. And what that does, it gets in people's way, a little bit of friction, and it removes all of the people who are just like spraying their CV around town to every tech company and don't really care about you and you get passionate, talented people creating these amazing experiences. This is the Facebook page of one of our marketing directors, Corey, and he sees this Unbounce ad. He's like, we're not doing paid advertising. Why am I seeing this? So he clicks on it, and not only did this person build a landing page, they wrote an ebook about why we should hire them, and then took out paid advertising to retarget us. <laughs> like, that's going above and beyond. That's amazing. That's you know, we didn't hire this guy. <laughs> A for effort. You know, he did give me permission to talk about it. <laughs> this is designing for ideal. Don't design to acquire customers. Design to acquire ideal customers. I'm going to show you in a second how you can do that. Okay, I'm going to talk about forms now. Uh, Disney put out a, had a new movie, so they put up a site. It's targeted at like 8 to 10-year-old kids, and they saw this massive uh, increase in people clicking the forgot password link. They're like, ah, that's really weird. Why? So they go to the database, and these passwords are up to 40 letters and numbers long. Like, that's weird. Okay, let's go to the source. What were these kids being asked to do when they choose their password? <laughs> no one's going to remember Mickey Minnie could be Float of Snow White Mowgli Dumbo. That's not going to happen. <laughs> the label on this field is way more powerful than you can imagine. So it, it got me thinking. I wanted to run an experiment to see if I can design for ideal using just a field label on a form. So I took this other course I wrote. What I was searching for were professional email addresses, so name at companyname.com, because then I know my email marketing is going to go to people when they're at work in a business mindset at their desk making business decisions. Way more influential email marketing rather than you know, a Gmail, Hotmail, AOL, or Yahoo, where they maybe they're, they're on the toilet in the evening and they're just doing something. They're not really thinking about business. Other than the business they're doing. <laughs> uh, so what I did was I tested, and this is an A-B test, so fully scientific. Um, for the label email address, 41% were pro. Your best email address, 47. Work email address, 50. Business email address, a 59% lift in professional email addresses with the addition of one word, business. It's an amazing way of increasing the quality instead of the quantity. It's, uh, that's how you design for ideal. How about what we should put on our buttons? Now, not in other words, submit, but what should we actually say on our call to action? So I looked at the data again. So in the red corner, we have any mention of the word free versus no mention of free, okay? Free, people think it's a persuasive word. Okay, drum roll. not mentioning free, right? People don't believe things are free anymore. Email address is social currency. You're taking something from me, and I know you're going to try and upsell, cross-sell, whatever, market to me afterwards, so I don't believe it. And we saw earlier when I tested free, it didn't work. It killed conversions. My versus your. Get my ebook, get your ebook. What kind of impact does that have? Massive difference. Maybe my is making more of a personal connection with people. I'm going to get my, a book for me. It's not for you. And we've done lots of tests on my versus your. My furnace always wins. Uh, action words. How can we inspire action? Click versus no mention of click. We know it's a button. You can click. Well, unless it's a ghost button. Um, <laughs> and you can click it, right? So surely saying click is a little bit obvious and isn't really going to help. It does. 
people like being told what to do, maybe sub subconsciously. Uh, well, let's make it even more persuasive. Click versus click here. So there's the 15.51. Even better. It's like, come, come over here. Click, click here. <laughs> Good boy. <laughs> How about some urgency? Uh, download versus download now. Yeah, it adds a little bit. Get started, get started now. Again, these tiny little changes can actually have an influence. I'm running a lot of tests right now. They don't all win. Some have no impact, but some of them do. So it's a really good thing to try. Where should your form be on the page? We know video should be up there. What about your form? Okay, well, this is the conversion rate according to how far down the page the top of your form appears. The, again, these are 250 pixel blocks. Three seems to be the sweet spot. Specifically. It's true. I couldn't believe it when a CTO told me. I'm like, yes, that's awesome. <laughs> So these outliers, if they get closer to these other guys in that sample size, they could increase their conversion rates by doing that. This is information hierarchy again. Don't be afraid to put it below the fold. Tell your story before you ask for something. Your video is your story. That's why that works up there. But a form is not part of your story. It's an action to get involved with the story after you understand it. That always helps too. Inline field labels, it's another design trend. People put field labels in fields. It pisses me off, it's stupid, here's why. Tabbing hides it. N some of them are getting better where it doesn't disappear, but you know, if you're on desktop, some people are tabbers, some people are clickers. I'm a tabber, so I'm like, da -da -da, tab. Someone says, oh, so there's a distraction. You know, someone says, hey, Ollie, I'm like, oh, what? And I've tabbed inside, I'm like, <sighs> now I don't know what it is. Now I have to click outside to see it come back. You just made me a clicker, I'm a tabber. You're changing my behavior, I don't like that. <laughs> don't do it. Uh, hard to double check. If you're doing a really complicated form, maybe for uh, a job or something governmental or something, you get to the end, you're like, okay, I think I'm ready. And it maybe even says, double check your work before you submit it, because you can only do it once or something. And you're like, uh, it's impossible. All the labels have gone, you've got 25 fields of information, and you're like, now you have to just blindly accept that you have got it right. And it's even worse on mobile. How many form fields should you have on your form? Okay, conversion rate according to the number of form fields. One is predictably the best. At the end, these are probably the high motivation serious forms like these job applications or the government things. So that kind of makes sense. But the interesting part, one is best, is this. There's no difference between four and seven. So if you have four form fields, Take three out, and you'll convert more. Or if you want to design for ideal and get quality, you can add three on average. Uh, so ask for some more information. It'll probably make your sales team happier if you have one. OK, so there's a lot of data, a lot of design stuff there. So we're going to put it all together to build the ultimate lead generation Franken page. These are all the questions that we've been asking and answering. <laughs> this goes on for six minutes. I only have three. Okay, so what we're going to do, I'm going to have a headline, I have a subhead. I'm going to flip the order of them. I'm going to put a video with an expert, 540 by 400, with a caption so people read it. A CTA 14% of the way through, keep it above the fold. I'm going to put a form with four fields, change it to seven. I had to make it in line. I'm going to move the headline so I can make this seven. I'll say business email address. Click here to download my thing now. Put it 666 pixels down the page. Say because 19 times. <laughs> This landing, com this landing page will convert like a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone wants to move to Canada, Montreal or, or Vancouver, and apply for a job at Unbounce, if you build this page, <laughs> I guarantee I'll hire you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>